Good evening. Uh, so I would like to introduce, uh, it's a pleasure, Job Flores of uh, Studio Monad Block. Uh, Monad Block is uh, based in Rotterdam, uh, but uh, operates in Europe and uh, perhaps is more associated with the broader European or world scene that emerged in the later 2000s, as opposed to perhaps the what, well, the Super Dutch scene also operated uh, in the whole world, but uh, the name suggests uh, it was uh, somehow related to the uh, Netherlands, uh, more or less, uh, or a wider context, uh, as opposed to the latter generation that uh, uh, is perhaps uh, more broader in uh, its uh, kind of a scope or, or also where uh, are based. But uh, I would like to hope to uh, take the stage and uh, Thank you. Thank you for your uh, introduction. Um, thank you also for inviting me. And um, thank you all for being here. Uh, because I also occasionally give a lecture online. But now we're all together in this room. Um, and therefore, I would also like to invite you to uh, talk to me afterwards. I mean, to be provocative, to raise questions, to get into a conversation, because I think that's uh, um, the plus of being together uh, in a room. Um, but first I will talk. So first I will try to give a, a lecture about recent projects, but also about projects that are uh, with us already for many years. Um, and I do this with the title Threefold Presence. So here you see us uh, when we were a bit younger. Um, the things I tell today um, is, of course, coming from the practice of Sander and House and me. Um, we run our office already for approximately 16 years from Rotterdam. And um, I always, as by means of habit, start to talk a bit about our name, the name of our office. Monetnok comes from this beautiful building in Chicago. Um, this is a building that I can talk about for hours. I will restrict this to a couple of minutes now. It's a building that was uh, designed by two pairs of architects, um, by Burnham and Root and Hollabert and Roche. Um, this complete building was uh, uh, finished or realized in uh, 1894 and um, this building has one name but it's designed by two different attitudes it's also you could say a transition in building culture where the right part of the building as you can see is made out of brick and the left part is made out of steel and plaster um, and steel is of course at that time the material of the future so the right part is built in the archaic material brick um, and it's one of the tallest load-bearing structures in brick. You can see a drawing and personally uh, we are let's say most in favor of uh, the right part by Burnham and Root which has uh, a beautiful reduced appearance. It's designed in a way that you could say it's like a sculptor works on a piece of clay. Um, and you can see that also brings a, a rather special type of ornamentation or refinement. Um, so everything comes out of the volume as it, as it is one piece of material. So when there's a plinth, there's no change in material. The expression comes from the bulping out of the plinth and it bulbs out for approximately one meter. And you can also see the orioles or bay windows bulping out of the facade with these rounded edges, which is also quite a plastic approach or with a, an approach with plasticity. And I think these things matter. If these things would not be there, these special moments, I think the building would be less interesting, less perhaps something we would have a harder time loving. And of course, there's quite some craftsmanship involved to get all these double curved 
uh, uh, bricks in the right place, which is beautiful, I think. And if you look at this edge, uh, then you can see the corner of the building developing over 16 floors from a sharp edge below to a rounded cornish on the top in a very elegant uh, uh, development, I think. Um, that is uh, an another example of, of beauty. And this building survived already more than 100 years. That's also interesting, because I think in these times where we talk about sustainability, um, you could say that this building is also an approach in sustainability. It is flexible, uh, it houses uh, offices, it has had apartments, and the structure is flexible enough to um, accommodate change um, over already quite a long time. But I think that's not uh, the only thing that determines sustainability, flexibility. I think there's also um, expression and character involved that makes the building survive already for such a long time. It's in the center of the city, in the loop of Chicago. And this is what it looks like nowadays. It's, of course, a very tall building. It's also um, it's, it's part of discussion among uh, architectural historians whether this would be the first skyscraper. But it had quite some impact on the, on the city when it was realized. Now, the fascinating thing for me, and that's something I've told already many times, and I tell it again, is that these architects, these two pairs of architects, chose also a different uh, uh, strategy of ornamentation or refinement. So Hollebert and Roche chose uh, a method to camouflage their new material of steel, while Burnham and Root actually worked on the refinement of the brick. And this is how the two buildings meet. So on the left side, we never ever see uh, the steel uh, revealed. It's always completely uh, uh, camouflaged. And in the beginning, we were a bit critical about this. We thought that's bad. Um, but um, we grew a bit older and thought, well, these are just two different approaches uh, on how to deal with construction and how to deal with perhaps something difficult as honesty um, in construction. Because Nowadays, we're not always able to build structures in massive brick any longer, of course. So we're always, we're always cladding things. Um, it's, of course, also, and that's the, the last part of the, uh, my love uh, uh, for this building uh, for tonight, and that is, it's also a building that stands in the city, in the city center, and it's a building that actually makes street. So it obeys to the conventions of a street. Um, it's not a sort of UFO that tells its own story. No, it's a building that combines character with the conventions of how the city grid is being made. How to perform within a city, how to perform in making a street. I think that is something which is really valuable. So I've told something about uh, the origin of our name. We were gr heavily inspired by this building and decided to use this name for our office. But we are located in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. What is the relation, you might ask yourself? Well, perhaps it's in, in a couple of these things that I just mentioned that we think that these are quite universal themes that do not necessarily restrict us to only being in America or in being in Chicago. But these are things that are valuable to talk about in Bratislava, but also in Rotterdam, for example, where we are located. And it also, this topic of uh, making uh, a building which also obeys to the conventions of a street, street architecture, is also something we find back in the architecture closer by the architecture of the city by Aldo Rossi, for example. Um, this is one of his uh, um, shopping centers. And um, 
it is um, it is also the nascence of our thinking, um, thinking about city, um, thinking about architect, architecture that makes city. Um, and another big source of inspiration is Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. Complexity and contradiction is something I need to mention, um, perhaps. Um, um, because it means um, that we always try to relate to um, both, uh, uh, let's say, popular col culture as well as uh, the history of architecture and try to mix these and try to find a balance between these in our uh, uh, practice, in our projects. That also brings me to the word or the phrase threefold presence. And for this I need to quote the inventor of this word, which is Paul Ricoeur, a French philosopher. And he explains threefold presence as articulating a relationship with the presence of the past, the presence of the present, and the presence of the future. And Mr. Ricoeur saw it as a merit of true action that all these three dimensions can be brought together in one singular moment. Now, that is beautiful, we think. So when we work on architecture, when we reflect on architecture, when we talk about arch architecture, this idea of threefold presence is in the back of our minds. We also see this as a, uh, let's say, um, yeah, something that is should be part of the agenda of architects to think about continuity to think about connecting architecture not only to the future but also to the past. And in our practice we work on architecture in a wide uh, uh, range. For us the realm of architecture consists of writing, publishing, curating, exhibiting, sometimes for a short moment of time and sometimes for longer. Of course, also building, which is actually not in this, l in this uh, list, but of course, that's number one. Now I'm going to use a couple of uh, uh, words to introduce uh, uh, some of the projects. And the first is, um, I'm going to show you some very short projects. So you have to imagine that um, we had chosen our name, Monetnok, and we were aiming to work on projects that would stay with us for a very long moment of time. And then our first commission was more or less uh, a temporary beach pavilion in the city center of Rotterdam. And that forced us, of course, to think a bit longer about the conceptual dimension of our name. Um, because perhaps we could be a bit more abstract, perhaps we could be a bit more open to other interpretations of um, uh, sustainability. Um, so this is a wooden pavilion with a steel structure. You can de uh, uh, demount it and uh, rebuild it again. Um, and it took us, um, I think, uh, uh, two months from the sketch design to the realization, while we were used actually to work on projects for uh, two years, um, because we had quite some um, uh, experience in housing in the Netherlands. And this was um, uh, the first result. So a very short uh, intervention. It's a beach in the city center of Rotterdam, and the beach required uh, an emblem. And strand means beach in Dutch. So it was an entrance uh, um, uh, pavilion. And then another commission followed for a festival um, in which we built a very large structure, a structure um, which quotes one of the architects of the Monetnok building, make no little plans. It's a quite long quote, so I will stop here. Um, this um, installation was uh, there for 10 days. Um, and we, in the beginning of our practice, um, were a bit ambivalent about these kinds of interventions because we wanted to work on serious architecture, on buildings that would uh, stay with us for a long time. But then 
these things crossed our path and we started to enjoy them more and more and more because they're actually laboratories um, in public space. And you can m actually do quite specific things and take quite big risks because um, after a while, 10 days, uh, it's gone again. Um, so that was for us a very inspiring new uh, environment. Uh, something we also proceeded with taking part, I taking part in exhibitions. This is an exhibition in Chicago where we made a, a, a big installation again based on the same theme, the quote of Burnham. And um, it also got us involved in further exhibitions. And I'll show you one uh, example uh, in collaboration with the artist uh, Gabriel Lester, a Dutch artist in uh, uh, Germany. We made this installation. Um, it's in the Schoen Kunsthalle, and the Schoen Kunsthalle is quite a challenging building because uh, it has an exhibition space which is very narrow and very long. Um, and it had several stages, and the circle here in the middle is our uh, installation. And our co collaboration with the artist was that Gabriel Lester um, uh, needed a space for a soundscape. Uh, so uh, for, um, um, I would say, six or seven whispering voices. So we designed um, a circular space, which was um, simple and understandable at first, but then would become more... Um, um, difficult to cross and would be more surprising and would actually force you to detour. So this was the simple scheme, uh, a circle with a couple of rooms inside and then in the rooms we would make openings. Some of the openings would be a window, others would be a door. So you would always have a good visual connection but you would not ever be able to look to walk straight through. Um, while you were crossing this circle, you would hear whispering voices from all sides. And this is the thing realized. It was there for, I think, three months. And what we like then is to, of course, add also a layer of uh, uh, material or tactility. So it's not just painted, but it's painted with sand, so you can also touch it. And besides being uh, getting lost and finding uh, uh, the way out again, um, we also hope to offer some moments of beauty, of course. And now I'm going to uh, uh, switch over to another project, a bigger project. This is about um, architecture in nature and uh, architecture uh, which deals with assemblage. It's uh, um, the park pavilion. It's in Otterlo in the center of the Netherlands. It's one of the biggest uh, national parks in the Netherlands and that required a visitor center. There was a competition for this visitor center and uh, we won the competition. And mm, there were two things that are worth mentioning. One is um, uh, it's an old uh, it's an old uh, estate, so it was owned by a, a German Dutch family, Kuller Müller, that also founded uh, a big museum there with a big art collection. And this family invited several architects like the Belgian architect Henry van der Velde to make a part of the museum. Um, also Mies van der Rohe and Peter Behrens uh, were invited to do sketches. And also uh, the Dutch architect Berlage um, was invited to make the hunting lodge, as it's called, um, as you can see here. That was realized. So um, quite some big names were uh, making buildings and studying on buildings in this environment. And then the client also told us um, 
that it this was going to probably be the last building in the forthcoming 50 years that they would realize. So that was quite an intimidating start of a commission, I think. Um, i show you briefly where it's located. You have to imagine that this national park uh, welcomes uh, half a million visitors per uh, year, um, and not all half million go to this uh, uh, visitor center, but at least quite a lot. Um, so it needed to be a welcoming visitor center, and at the same time, it needs to have a story. This is the museum um, with the part of Henry van der Velde, but an extension of the Dutch architect Quist. And in the near future, there will be an extension by um, Tadao Ando. And this is uh, uh, the Berlage uh, building. And we also make drawings before we start, and sometimes while we are designing. And this was one of the drawings we made. This is the volume that we proposed. It's actually uh, this visitor center, which is actually a strange typology. It doesn't really exist. Um, it is, um, it's a combination of programs. It's a restaurant. Um, it's an uh, information desk. It's a shop. Um, but it also has meeting rooms, uh, four meeting rooms. And one of the, it's 3,000 square meters. And one of the things that struck us was that 3,000 square meters in this uh, forest uh, was had quite some impact. So we wanted to make the building look a bit smaller. Um, so one of the things we did was dividing the building into two uh, parts. Instead of making one big pitched roof, we divided it in two pitched roofs. And also we curved the building like a banana. Um, in order to make it look a bit smaller, something we learned from Baroque architects. Um, and then we said there are parts of the uh, building that are very, um, that are visible from far away, and there are parts of the building that you will really experience nearby and are able to touch. And of course, it made us think what kind of building should we add to these to these other buildings that are already there and we found out that perhaps for us a, uh, a welcoming a visitor center should be something like a country house um, with a, uh, a place where you can warm your hands drink something warm and then continue your walk through the park and for that we used three uh, references and we always actually start searching for references. And we also share these references with our clients because we think it's important to tell uh, what's on our mind when we make a design and why certain things are possible and other things are impossible. So one of the motives that we uh, 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 saw was that in the uh, buildings of uh, uh, legends, uh, the English architect, we noticed that he makes quite a big distinction between the building and nature. So he doesn't try to make the building act like nature. It's not a hill with trees on top. Um, no, it's a building. It has its own language, but it makes a relation with nature um, by beautiful vistas, um, by the way you enter the building, uh, by movement through the building. Um, and um, um, Lutjens uh, uses very emblematic uh, silhouettes, uh, very emblematic roof shapes. And then the second uh, reference we used is the Woodland Chapel by Asplund, which is in Stockholm. It's a beautiful, modest and small building. And you could almost miss it because it's so small, uh, has a dark uh, low roof, uh, but the interior of the building uh, contains a beautiful surprise. I will show you later. And then the last one was not so far from here, the Corbacci uh, Cafe by Lacaton Vazal in Vienna. Um, 
which is also a beautiful example of a quite characteristic and outspoken ceiling. Um, another motive for us. So here you see again uh, Lutjens with the uh, with the very outspoken silhouette of the uh, of the roof, uh, and this is the interior of the woodland chapel. Again, I use the word baroque because that's something we uh, learned in the age of the Baroque in architecture, that geometries can actually uh, individualize. So the geometry of the interior of this building is not reve revealed in the exterior and vice versa. So the beautiful dome that is inside is not to be read from the outside. Uh, and that is really a beautiful surprise, I think. And we noticed in this uh, uh, in this bar in Vienna that um, there's a very pragmatic side to this reference. We thought after five or after ten years the chairs and the tables will change again in this interior that we design. And what makes the space? Of course, the shape of the space, um, but also a very outspoken ceiling is the carrier of the character of a space. Um, so that means that all the rest could change, but the uh, ceiling, a bit like the ceiling here in this space, will really uh, be very outspoken and remain outspoken. Um, again, I show you uh, uh, the plan of the visitor center, and you have to imagine that you approach from the top, then there's a big parking lot with trees, and then you see the head of the building, and this is a central square where you can get a bike and cycle around. And this is the building. When you approach, you first see the big emblematic head of the building. And it already reveals a bit of the interior, but not too much. This is the section of the building. And the building is, I would say, uh, is designed through the section. The section is actually the most dominant steering element. And there's a pulsing idea in the section. So you enter low at three meters, then you come in a high space. This is a special ceiling, something uh, that we learned from Asplund, um, that it's beautiful to have a surprise uh, a vaulted uh, ceiling and then you go low if you go up then you go a bit lower again three meters and then you enter in the stairs which is high again over two floors and then again in a lower uh, corridor and then you enter the uh, meeting rooms each me meeting room has its own uh, uh, typical uh, ceiling uh, type so it's again small and big, small and big, a bit of a pulsing uh, way of dealing with heights. Again, the section. Um, and then you have to imagine that the curve in the building allows you to make quite a natural distinction between the several parts of the program. So we enter in the middle of the building and then we go to the right and then we're in the park shop. And then we go to the left and then we're in the restaurant. But by the curve, these things are quite naturally uh, separated. Here you can see the plan. So again, enter in, in the middle. And when you make a curve, you can of course make the glass curved, but you can also say, no, we do a zigzag uh, uh, facade. And this zig zigzag facade actually allows you to sit outside, covered by a roof, or to sit inside, and then you sit close by the, uh, by the windows as well, in a lowered uh, sort of bay window. And this big wide space here, you have to imagine that's the kitchen. So this is the public part, and this is the back of the house with storage rooms, uh, toilets, and a very big kitchen because this kitchen needs to serve 500, uh, uh, for example, people between 11:30 uh, and uh, and uh, and 1:30, something like that. Um, 
this is the first level where you can see the different meeting rooms. It's a spine, you could say, here. A corridor which connects you to all the various rooms. We really try to avoid making a very generic, very flexible uh, uh, structure here where everything could be connected. No, we said that every room should have its own character. And I will show you quickly how the building is built up. So I used the word country house as a typology and we use also quite literal referencing to a country house. So a country house has a pitched roof, we think, in general. Uh, it has wooden paneling, so that's also something you see happening here. And it has a fireplace, a very important element. These are very literal elements that we also really embraced. And then we go up, again the corridor, and then you see the meeting rooms and everything together with people. And there's one side of the building that is very transparent with the zigzag facade. And there's one side of the building which is more silent. So you have to imagine that in the meeting rooms on the first floor, you look over uh, uh, into the forest, into the trees. And downstairs here on the ground level, is where the distribution takes place. We wanted to hide this, of course. Nowadays, this is all green, filled with ve vegetation. And at night, this is a bit of a light box. The light comes from the building itself. And during the day, it doesn't immediately reveal what is inside. The materials we use is uh, brick, and aluminium. One of the first things we heard during the briefing for this competition was that our client said no wood. Because we have experience with wood in the forest and we have a lot of maintenance on the wood because it gets green, it gets dirty. Um, so we want to avoid this. We absolutely don't want any wood. So nowadays, this was 10 years ago, we would probably have a longer discussion about this. Not necessarily for wood on the outside, but at least for wood in the inside. Now it is a very simple steel structure that is completely cladded. You will never see or experience this steel structure. And we used, I would say, a very noble or archaic material of uh, a brick. Uh, it's a clinker. It's a very hard clinker that doesn't absorb any uh, humidity uh, and therefore actually does not pollute or does not get dirty. And we combine this with aluminium, a very industrial uh, uh, simple material which is then anodized in gold and we really liked this combination of these two materials. And here you can see the entrance. When you make such a big roof you also want to have um, elements of scale. So we used these big dormer windows to break the surface of the roof and to add tactility and scale to the building. Of course, these windows also make sure that light enters the building. And we slowly turn around. And you've seen the head of the building. The head has this circular vault that is visible. And it is, this is the tail of the building. The tail is much more informal, I would say. It's less emblematic, it's more picturesque. It's a bit chaotic also. We did this on purpose on the because we like this to be the more, uh, uh, let's say, informal side, where the ter terrace of the building peeps out, um, where you can sit in the sun. And of course, we used one strategy for the facades. It's a vertical ribs or lamellas that are completely wrapped around the building. And on purpose, we tried to make the aluminium of the same dimension as the size of the bricks so that they meld together. 
And sometimes it's also really hard to see the difference. And sometimes these, um, these verticals, they change in size. As you can see here, it has a wider spacing than here. And that is, uh, allows us some flexibility in the implementation of windows and doors. So it makes sure that there is coherence and simultaneously it allows variation. And we keep on making then these images of moments in the building. And then we go into the interior where you can see the vaulted ceiling. Now we started with the idea that we would have projections on the ceiling, literal projections or paintings on the ceiling. And then we involved um, a lighting designer, uh, Beers Nielsen from Rotterdam, and they said, let's imagine you walk over a path in the forest during a sunny day and you see the sun through the leaves projecting a pattern on the path. Shall we try something like this on the ceiling? Uh, something that can gradually change. So they did, as you can see here, there's a projection of the idea of leaves. And this changes over the day. So there's a slight movement, like the wind is blowing. And here you can see the uh, bay windows where the people are sitting close to the windows. And you can see the curve in the building. So this is where the park shop is, seen from the restaurant. And the material palette is quite simple. So it's wood, everything here is uh, oak, um, and it's up to three meters. And above, everything is more abstract in white plaster. And the head is quite... Um, extraordinary big, uh, making quite a monumental gesture, of course, with this large window where the light comes in. And the other side, the tail of the building, is more literal again. There we designed a fireplace, which is much too big, but it's also more of a symbol. It's an inviting symbol to sit and warm your hands. And it's completely tailor-made. And this is the stairs going up into the corridor. And here are some of the meeting rooms. And this is what you see in the evening. Now I will talk about another project, um, about context and vocabulary. Um, this is about an uh, older project in uh, Nieuwbergen, uh, that is in the east of the Netherlands. And this is a bit of a strange project because um, it was an open competition for a uh, landmark. It's here located close to the German border. And here you can see a map of the river called Maas or Meuse. And this uh, village called Nieuwbergen is actually a new town. And in the new town, the car was prioritized during the 60s. Um, so you have to imagine that when we got here for the first time, that this area here was uh, a central parking lot and there were shops around. So that's very efficient. But if you want to celebrate a form of community, um, you could also imagine that a market square would uh, uh, be fit for that. So that was one of the plans for the restructuring of this uh, 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 center, to make this into a market square, to make this uh, a new complex with housing and uh, commercial uh, with shops. And then there should be a landmark. And that was the brief, a landmark. And we asked what should be in the landmark. Yeah, we don't know. Um, so we just had to design something that was tall um, and visible. And this is what we saw when we entered. So the central parking lot. And what we do then is we start thinking about form. We start thinking about collections of form. If you have to make something vertical, something tower-like, 
which of course cannot be a real skyscraper tower, but something which is a, a tall structure. Now we noticed of course that there are quite a lot of these and in this area, which is an old mining area, we found industrial structures and less industrial structures. And some of these structures are made out of one piece, uh, like uh, this one, for example. And some of them are assembled, a small house with something on top. Some of them have a very uh, characteristic uh, silhouette. Other ones grow from something small into something bigger. So we could learn actually a lot from these references. But the reference we finally found that for us was adequate was a building which is called a wage building or trade building, which you can find in many places on uh, old market squares in the Netherlands, in Belgium, also in Germany. And these are quite typical buildings because they um, resonate something civic. Uh, simultaneously, they are not religious. They do not belong to uh, the municipality. Um, but they most of the time have quite a um, special status. Um, they also have a quite strange appearance uh, or particular uh, appearance. Most of the time they are quite small, but they try to be big. Um, they're very vertical. Uh, they're uh, richly ornamented, cladded with rich materials, quite refined. And um, you only have one of these. Um, and what we learned from these typologies was that there is a very, let's say, dynamic ground level where the goods were taken in and were um, prepared for trade and uh, were um, um, measure measured or uh, their weight was uh, noted. And then on top, the first floor most of the time was a more administrative uh, floor, a more silent floor. And this helped us to think about what kind of building we could make there. So we thought we make a very tactile house. And on top of this house, we stack two towers because they want something big and that is visible from far away. So we make an assemblage of two motives, something which is welcoming and something which is more abstract. You have to imagine that all the small villages in this area, they have their own church tower. And this church tower gives them a place on the horizon. This new town, dating from the 60s, did not have such a landmark. So therefore, they made it into an architectural uh, uh, competition. So this small house with two towers uh, has a very simple scheme a low tower and a high tower, and this base is square. The small tower is something we learned from fortresses, that you have a sort of small house on top that allows you to enter the balcony or first level. Um, and in our case, that would mean that you would have a sort of uh, uh, moment where you could step over to the next tower which we did not have to insulate then. This is the scheme. And you have to imagine that this is quite an artificial thing because um, we asked our client after winning the competition with this proposal, what should we do in uh, this uh, building? And then he always replied, it could be a bar, but it could also be a jeans shop. Um, uh, and that was, of course, a bit uh, uh, difficult for us, um, but it also forced us to be very, um, let's say, flexible in the interior. So we decided that it should be a civic and festive building. And this is the building as it is right now, as it is realized. So we used all kinds of ornamentations, uh, brick ornamentations that we found in the environment. We also used conventions that we found in the environment, arches, for example. And we tried to use this vocabulary to build something new. A building that gave identity to this uh, 
new town. And when you make a small building that tries to be important, uh, you have to do quite some gestures to get there. So the first thing we did was adding a grid to the facade that would structure the whole facade. And this grid is not a representation of where the floors are, because the floor is here. And the grid is actually the most dominant element, so it also crosses the windows here. It also kills the arches here, and it's wrapped around, because this is, is a building that is, that is in the middle of this uh, uh, small town, and it does not have a backside. So as you can see, the grid is wrapped around, and we only make changes with the windows. So sometimes we group the windows, and sometimes we separate the windows. And this is the plan. So one quarter of the square is filled with serving uh, elements, storage, circulation to go up. And then here is the small tower. You enter the balcony, uh, you have a look over the market square, and then you continue in the second tower. You go all the way up, and then you have a beautiful view over the landscape. This is the section. And I just told that we used um, um, patterns from the uh, bricks we found in the surroundings, but we also used a Brazilian uh, bond in the bricks um, because that allowed the wind to go through uh, the high tower which is better for structural engineering, of course. And actually, the basis of this uh, building is a red brick. The complete building is red. Uh, but we um, painted the bricks with cement slurry. Um, and this cement slurry is greenish, grayish green. Depends a bit on the humidity. And for us, that was quite a new step to paint a building, because we had learned at school and in practice that uh, using the uh, material brick is a noble material. You can actually, uh, it has its beauty on its own. Um, but in this project, we actually were confronted with quite a uh, lack of budget. So we could not afford green bricks. Um, so we decided to paint them. And this was actually um, the beginning of the painting of bricks for us. Um, and that means that sometimes um, you can see that the, the red still comes through a bit, which is actually a present, we think. And we started with a very simple way, because all of a sudden we had two colors, we started to make patterns. So there were, of course, places where we could not make uh, windows. But uh, then we used this blind window uh, and made a pattern. And then something very nerdish that architects love, that is that we on one side made uh, green diagonals and on the other side we made red diagonals in the brickwork. These subtilities are, we think, uh, important. And here you can see how it's wrapped around. And in the beginning, Unfortunately, the building was empty, as you can see here, um, which is, of course, uh, painful uh, because it means that it's, of course, bringing identity. But what kind of identity? So it's actually the first years, it actually really uh, performed as a folly. Um, and later it got uh, uh, used, a bar went in and went bankrupt again, and another ba bar went in. And it started, we started asking ourselves, perhaps this community is not large enough to have a beautiful bar. But then again, um, that there will be a new bar in now. So it constantly is uh, um, yeah, evolving, uh, this building. Here you can see the other side. We go around. Here you can see the bonds in the brickwork and the change in the diagonals. And this is what you experience when you're up. You can see the church tower of another village. So the idea is that this 
tower is publicly accessible. So you enter the bar and ask whether you are allowed to go up. So the owner of the bar takes care of the building. And then you can go all the way up. And when the bar is closed, of course, you cannot go up any longer. The basis of this building is in situ poured concrete. Um, and on top of this building, there's a large billboard. You remember the installation that we did, Make No Little Plans? We had to think of that because the tower is a sort of billboard. It needs to be visible from far away. It needs to shout that this important small town is there. And we also treated it almost literally as a folded billboard with a representative site and a site which is less representative. So remember this. So this is the back site, which is beautifully raw, also something we really like. And it's not so massive as you might think. It expresses perhaps cohesion and massivity, but there's no chance that it's really true. It's on high heels, so to say, and it really acts as assemblage, I would say. And when we talk about a grid, we also think about the depth of a grid and how a beam touches a column and what kind of detail is required for that. And therefore, we make models, plaster models. We make details, of course. And this is how the building is there nowadays. So here you can see the new complex, and here you can see the old complex from the 60s. And I think that we tried to be neither part of them, but also not really part of them. So it's a bit of a solitary building, which simultaneously wants to connect with the context, but not in a very literal way. And later we found that in an old village nearby, there was a ruin of a tower on the graveyard. And this is our wish for our landmark to end like a beautiful ruin. That would be beautiful, we think. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that are currently um, on our tables that we are working on. Um, I'll just briefly talk about them because it's more a sort of promise because they are not realized yet. Um, because these smaller projects that I have shown are actually not making city necessarily, huh? perhaps this project a bit, but it's hardly city uh, where we are. So at the moment we're um, involved in um, bigger housing schemes in the Netherlands, but also in Germany. Um, and this is uh, where we build uh, two blocks together with two other architects. And this is a so-called mixed program of not only housing, but also a social and commercial uh, program. But also um, what is um, for us uh, interesting in this um, uh, complex is that it has a mixture of uh, housing types for low incomes and uh, for higher incomes and that it's completely mixed instead of separated. So we work on these two gray parts. This is a, a Salvation Army, and uh, this is a middle income uh, housing. And the main idea is that the two blocks are actually connected by three uh, courts. Um, two courts that are semi-public and one which is completely public. So. Here we are in the middle, that's located here, the public part. Um, and what we try to do is give expression to moments of meeting. So the moments where circulation uh, takes place and is expressed very uh, uh, well in the building. That is where we think that the meeting also uh, can take place. So we want to avoid making very um, big complexes of housing where people never meet each other. We, uh, we make this into a design tool. Um, that means that um, these buildings are sturdy and robust um, and simultaneously contain a lot of um, invitations for a meeting. 
at the gates, at the entrances, um, at the passages, um, at the large uh, entrance halls. Simultaneously, these are the moments where, um, yeah, let's say the standardization uh, takes place. Yeah. I've shown you now um, the landmark building, but also the park pavilion. And these are quite tailor-made uh, uh, buildings, small-scale buildings. And here we really have to deal with uh, st the standardization in uh, Dutch building culture, where repetition is a very important factor. We also are invited to um, make uh, an another landmark, a landmark made out of housing. So we build or we work on the outskirts uh, of a city, um, the part where you don't have an historic center, um, but where the substance of the city is not so strong. And there we are invited to bring character. So we make a proposal for a uh, tower that uh, gives orientation to the central square that is in front of the tower. And it needs to be visible from all sides, so the building has a quite specific uh, performance with chamfered uh, corners, and one is, uh, uh, let's say, zigzagged towards the uh, central square. We also do social housing. These are uh, very small uh, uh, student housing units. Um, it's a quite long uh, building and for us then the challenge is how to make this long building again look more uh, human and small scale. So we add a quite big layer of plasticity to it. These are brick buildings and um, the uh, groundwork has begun for this building. So it will probably be uh, realized by the end of next year. Uh, this is um, um, a building that we currently work on in a former industrial area close to a city center in Tilburg, in the south of the Netherlands. And the question we get here is how can you make a new housing environment, a domestic environment, without losing the character of the indust industrial uh, uh, complex that was there before. Do you then need to make uh, a housing building look like a fabric or a factory? Or can you make something uh, which resonates uh, a factory in a very, I would say, subtle way? Simultaneously, we are working in uh, Hanover in, in Germany on a big uh, housing scheme, um, which is in a quite specific area called uh, Linden. Um, and in this area, um, the whole structure of the city consists of perimeter blocks, and these perimeter blocks, each of them have several houses. So you can see that here. So instead of a perimeter block out of one part, it consists of countable houses. And that actually defines the graining of the city, of the street. So that's also something we proposed here in our competition proposal, to not make one big complex, but to make a complex out of six blocks, S six houses, six separate houses where three houses would be large and three houses would be low. They are a bit like the cement between the, uh, the buildings. And it's quite, um, um, let's say, an, um, a, a, a mixture of programs. It contains uh, commercial spaces on the ground level, but also elderly housing, free market apartments. And because of its location, it's actually finalizing this vacant plot it's the entrance to Linden, the uh, neighborhood, and it's, this is a very popular student street with, with a lot of uh, bars and restaurants um, and a quite uh, uh, heavy nightlife. Um, so this is actually going to be the, the gate to this uh, area. And therefore it also needs to be a bit more outspoken, I would say. So when we decided to make three higher buildings, 
we also realized that we would see the side facades of these buildings and we gave them big eyes that look at you. And the rest is out of red brick and we used uh, uh, a duotone of a lighter brick that combined that makes difference and connects to the uh, gradient of the surroundings. Now I'm going to uh, uh, sh uh, um, now I'm going to close off with uh, uh, the last project, and that is the Atlas House. Um, that is again a small project of a private house in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And Eindhoven is uh, uh, perhaps also known for you uh, is the place where the Philips uh, company was uh, 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 originates from. And in the Netherlands, we of course um, uh, built new houses and um, we structure these neighborhoods, these new neighborhoods in a very tight pattern. But there are always moments in this tight pattern where it's a bit more difficult. Um, and that's where we uh, invite people to buy a plot of land and make their own dream castle. Um, and some people uh, do this, um, also our clients. So they obtained um, a piece of land here, a small plot. And you have to imagine that the beauty of this plot is that it looks into this old estate where the family Philips uh, used to live in this house. And it re will remain uh, green uh, and in use as an estate for many t ages. And this is the plot, so the clients had a, a bit of money to buy this plot and um, then um, they had a small budget left uh, for a big house, at least that's what they wanted. Um, so um, a big wish for a big house and a small budget is always a nice challenge for an architect. Um, so we said yes, and then we proposed two things. We proposed a model for a sort of bungalow, so we would fill the whole plot with one floor and then make a hole in the middle where a tree would grow, a patio, and you would live around the tree, or we would do the opposite. We would make a small compact footprint and then make a tower house, a very vertical house, and then on the small plot, you would be able to walk around this uh, house. And they chose for the second model, let's call it the tower house. And one of the um, uh, urban uh, conditions was that um, it needed to be a light uh, house, um, light materialization. Brick was absolutely allowed, could also be plaster. But our wish was to um, make a house which would have brick in the exterior and also in the interior, preferably low bearing walls out of brick, as we had learned from the Monetnov building. Um, but that turned out to be quite a challenge and not so uh, uh, cheap. Um, so um, in the end, um, we have cavity walls with bricks on the outside, then uh, insulation and then walls of brick in the inside. We had quite long discussions with the clients because we turned uh, the house uh, 45 degrees on the plot um, because we thought it would be better to experience also the length of this uh, street along the trees. That um, it would also give a bit more privacy because we knew that there would be neighbors coming here and here on these uh, uh, both neighboring plots. And it's a very simple scheme. It's a very repetitive scheme. It's actually five rooms on each floor, three small rooms and two big rooms, always separated by a wall. So you always experience the transition from one room to the other room. And that's because you will always experience the wall that is in between. 
and the middle of the small rooms contains the stairs. And we liked this idea um, of a collection of rooms. That's also something we see in housing in Central Europe, where you have a collection of rooms and sometimes um, these rooms are more or less of the same size sometimes. So you could use the room as a eating or dinner room, or you could use a room as a kitchen or as a sleeping room, and you can change them after time. So that was also a bit the idea of this, that we would have a collection of rooms, and each room would have its own character. So we made the difference in the section. Also, this is a section project, where the section is actually uh, where the project develops. And that's something you don't see on the outside. So the outside does not reveal anything about what is happening in the inside. But the inside has quite um, a playful difference in height. So some rooms are four meters high, other rooms are 230. And we started by uh, thinking that making the interior out of brick would be very a very cheap solution and they could finish it later if they wanted to, but at least we would first try to live, uh, uh, or actually they would first try to live in, uh, in this brick environment. And we, this project was the first actually of, uh, so you can see here the fence around it. Later there are also pictures of the completed or the finished project. But here you can see how it almost touches the crowns of the trees and how uh, the, the crowns of the trees are uh, welcoming, so to say. So it's quite beautiful to live here, I think. And then we started to paint the brick again. So with a wide slurry, and we tried to avoid making this project too abstract. So the role of the joints is very important when you talk about brickwork. Is the joint flush with the front of the bricks? Is it recessed 10 millimeters, so you get much more plasticity of the brick? Or are the joints bulping out? And when we make uh, facades, um, we are very insecure, as you can see. So we do a lot, a lot of tests. We do a lot of searching for the right answer, and this is a selection of the, the things we tried. And there are some influences. Um, I've mentioned in the beginning Venturi Scott Brown. This is a fire station. And what we find so intriguing about this fire station is that there's a white surface that makes this building quite extraordinary. If the white surface would not be there, it would just be a rather simple red building with something high. But the white surface, which is acting a bit weird, it's denying the window here. It's not halfway the window, it just stops somewhere here. And here it stops too, too early. Why isn't it going all the way to the end? And here as well, it's also doing something weird. So this very thin layer of color charges the whole building and makes it more extraordinary. That's quite a beautiful thing that, of course, inspired us also in the landmark. But also in this Atlas house. And then there's in, in the Netherlands this tradition of making uh, uh, um, brick housing in red, which is then ornamented with plaster elements, which originally are made out of uh, more noble, rich material like limestone. But the cheap version is to do this in plaster. And these plaster elements, they represent keystones, uh, cornishes, uh, dripping uh, lines. So they are actually ornamental uh, elements. And these, is, these are all, uh, or these two are quite inspiration, big inspirations for us. So we started also by making keystones, also in places where they were actually not required because there's a lintel here, there's also a lintel here. So therefore these keystones are a bit lifted up so you can still see the lintel. But there are also places where the keystones have escaped and just are around as a more compositional element. 
And you have to imagine that the windows do not reveal what is happening behind. So sometimes you're close to the window and sometimes the floor is much lower. Uh, you have more protection from the window. And this changed later, I will show you later a picture. And when you decide to put this paint on this red building, then you get also surprises, pleasant surprises, like you don't uh, paint the depth of the window, so that becomes a sort of ornament. And here you can also see what the joints are doing. The joints are bulping out and they're brushed quite roughly. That's something we learned from uh, Leverens, this, uh, uh, this uh, Swedish architect. There are still people passing by asking the clients whether the house is finished or not. Um, but we like this type of roughness in architecture. Because it catches the light in a beautiful way and it really makes uh, a layer of tactility steps away from abstraction and it unifies the whole building. Of course, we had to practice a bit and talk a bit about it. And when you have several, um, when you have several uh, heights in the floor, you also need a stair that mediates between these heights. So you go up, go up, and sometimes you have to go down a bit then to go up again. This is the room for the stairs. These are the stairs, wooden stairs. And there was a brick layer that was very happy with cutting this part of the, uh, of the top. And we insisted on doing this because if this would not be done, the whole building would be very serious. And we think that the building should also have something playful. And the building should also have something light. So despite the heaviness perhaps of the brick, we liked the idea of a textile top. And this is how the building performs nowadays together with the garden and the neighbors have arrived. So we put some tables in front of the building. This is a table to avoid you getting wet when you fetch your keys. And it indicates where the entrance is. And then we slowly go around. And this is the other table that is placed in front of the doors. And currently, the studio of the clients is downstairs. The uh, kitchen is here, and they sleep here. And on top, there's a roof terrace where they have the most privacy. And here, you can see the first year of their inhabitation where everything remains raw. And then they started to paint parts of the interior as well. But these moments are always important, where you see the shifting in height, where you see the sh shifting between the two rooms. And here you can also see that there is an interior window between the kitchen and the other dining room. I can talk quite a long about uh, uh, how the windows are positioned, but this is a bit what I meant with uh, the proximity to the windows. When the floor is high, you can actually look outside very well. And the two windows combined together form a sort of dormer window or an oriel. And what we really like is that the clients start to embrace, of course, their weird building. Um, so they started to make uh, uh, brass uh, cranes for their kitchen and a concrete bathtub. And this is how the building looks together with the neighbors. And you can see that the majority is white. And what is important to mention is that now the roof terrace is offering the most privacy where you can look between the crowns of the trees. Um, Thank you for your attention.